Hello. Can you come nice and um, talk to us about estate planning? You've been very instrumental in one of our members' states, and I think you can help us with the others. So, welcome. I don't have the mic on here, so I'm not going to talk any longer. <laughs> All right. Uh, because uh, the, the group is small in number, this can be very casual and informal. Please feel free to interrupt me at any time, for any reason, with any questions. Uh, the one exception might be <clears throat> the personal discussion that you want to have at length about your personal situation. I would suggest that that be deferred so that the rest of us can just get the basic information. If you'd like to talk more personally, that's fine. You can stay af afterwards, or you can come over to the office and pay money and have a real office visit with a lawyer. So this is the basic information. You've been learning about finances for weeks now. So we will not be learning about finances. This talk is going to make a huge assumption. And that assumption is that you do own something when you die. How much you own is not the point. The point is that you own something when you die. And you will leave, but what you own will stay. My role is to assist you if you want or need help in determining what happens to that which stays. It's that simple. You could hear this talk for half an hour, 45 minutes, get the information you need, never need an attorney. That's fine with me. I'm here to equip the church, Ephesians chapter 4. I'm not here to convince you to hire me. If the church is informed and equipped and becomes good stewards of what God has given you, then you can obey him. He says to be good stewards, and that's good enough for me. If you decide, oh, I'd like to hire that man, feel free. I'm across the parking lot. So here's the information. Uh, the first thing I would say is Bill and Mary own some assets. What do they own? It doesn't matter. If you own a house, checking account, savings account, stock, bonds, investment with a broker, maybe no stocks, no bonds, maybe a 401k from work, maybe an IRA, TCREF account from being a teacher, a vacation property, Maybe you're just renting an apartment and living off Social Security, and all you own are personal items, a small checking account for the Social Security to flow through. It doesn't matter. Whatever you own is what you own, and if it's left in your name, we call that your estate. If it's left in your name, we call that your estate. If it's not left in your name, it may not be in your estate, it may have gone to someone else automatically, which may be good news or bad news. So I would offer this definition to you for estate planning. I made this up. It's not in the law. Leaving what you have to those you love. That's the main thrust. Leaving what you have, whatever you have, to those you love. Two premises, that you own something, that you love somebody. If you own nothing and love no one, estate planning is really not necessary. And to do so how you want to do it, and when you want to do it, and the way you want to do it, and at the least possible cost. This is my personal offer to you of a definition of estate planning. Now, when you plan a vacation, or a wedding, or a birthday party, you plan how you want to for someone that you love, and you do so the way you want to and at the least possible cost. Nothing different about estate planning. It's like planning for a vacation that you're not coming back from. There are three obstacles 
to doing this efficiently. And they're simple. They can all be avoided. The fourth obstacle I have no control over. These three I could help you with. One is called living probate, where you are alive, but you become sick, very sick. And you're in the hospital, or you're in rehab, or you have Alzheimer's, or you have dementia, and you've done no planning, and the money begins to disappear, and sometimes we have to go to probate court and obtain help for you, such as get you a guardian. That is not cost efficient, nor does it have to happen. It's easily avoided. But living probate, going through probate while you're still alive, eats into our definition. The second obstacle is death probate. When you die, if you leave things in your name, we go to probate court again, and we spend time and money there to transfer your assets out of your name. Does it work? Of course. But time and money are expended. So it eats into our definition. It won't be the way you want to, when you want to, how you want to, and certainly won't be at the least possible cost. Estate taxes is just another tax. And any time you pay tax, it's not going to the people that you love. So it can be an obstacle. All of these can be addressed, and all can be avoided. The one obstacle that I cannot help you with is procrastination. Nothing I can do about it. Let's say that Bill becomes mentally disabled with Alzheimer's disease. We don't want this to happen. But there's a lot of things that we don't want to happen that God allows. So he allows this, among other things. And if this happens, no one has died. But who will manage Bill's property? If his property is owned in joint tenancy, Bill and another, that asset cannot be sold. You're stuck. Bill is disabled. He has Alzheimer's. He can't sign anything. So that asset is frozen. What if it's a vacation home and it's time to sell? You don't need it anymore. You can't. You can't sell it. One of the owners has Alzheimer's. Oh, well, what would we do? Get a guardian. Wow, that seems so burdensome. That's correct. A little planning can go a long way. Well, what if Bill has a will? Well, we don't use a will when someone has Alzheimer's. We don't use a will until someone dies. So the will is not going to help us here. No one's died. So problems do come up even when you're alive. Living probate, this obstacle, is the legal proceedings in court when you are disabled, incompetent, or unable to manage your own affairs. Again, we don't want this. But we don't want cancer either. We don't want divorce. We don't want lots of things. We don't want people blowing themselves up, blowing up airplanes. We live on Earth. So it's good to plan. It's good to have God in your life and wisdom and do what you can, notwithstanding we're still on Earth. The disadvantages of going through court are obvious. No time has to be spent here. It costs money. It takes time out of your life. It requires a public testimony in the courtroom in front of other people. You have to give accountings to the judge for everything you're doing. And based on the facts, it can be a little embarrassing or humiliating to say to a judge, well, Your Honor, my mother has Alzheimer's. She can't remember the name of the children. She puts her slippers in the freezer. She puts the ice cream in the oven. We're very concerned. The judge says, go on. I'm not going to give her authority away without hard facts. Go on. Well, Your Honor, this is a little embarrassing. Do you want the guardianship, young man, or not? I have other cases. Go on. Convince me. And the attorney's sitting there for whatever, $250 an hour? Not a pretty picture. So it can be avoided through a document called power of attorney. $125 usually is the average price of a power of attorney. $125. If you never use it, at least you have it. And uh, it's kind of like most people drive around with a spare tire in their car and never use it. You only have four wheels. 
Why drive around with five tires? But we all do it. This is kind of like a spare tire. Ma'am. No. Less the rest of your life. If you're healthy, someone could use it if you wrote it up that way. Say you're on vacation. And they need to pay the phone bill or the mortgage. Fine. You give them power of attorney. If you're sick and in the hospital, someone can use it if you wrote it up that way. They can use it for just one little thing. Just pay my bills or for everything you can imagine. It's all up to you. It's you granting authority to someone else. It's you saying, if needed, please sign my name for me. Not take my money. Sign my name. Use my money for my needs. Nothing's been given away. This is not a will. No one has died. Yes? It is not assumed that your spouse has that. Many power of attorneys are one spouse giving it to the next spouse and vice versa, and then to the children or the best friend from church or something of that nature. Yeah. Sir? Sir, you can get a power of attorney when you said that one spouse to another can have a stipulation that if, say, if both spouses are, are in a situation that can go on to the children, that have to be another mistake. That should be in a well drafted power of attorney because what if both spouses are in the same car accident? and they're both in the hospital. And there's things to do, things to be signed. Power of attorney could automatically say, in this situation, go to the eldest child, or the middle child, or the baby, or whoever. Precious investment for $125. Avoiding guardianship. Avoiding guardianship. Absolutely. Absolutely. From any human to any human. Yeah. Now, here's another document that's useful when you're alive. It's called living will. This document says one thing. Do you wish to be left on the respirator machine or the heart machine or the kidney machine if there is no medical hope for you to ever recover. Oh, I don't want to think about it. Okay, next slide. Don't think about it. Don't think about any of this. But as a steward of life, as a steward of life, think about the position that your children or family would be in if you never think about it and it happens. You've heard the cases, Ted Williams, famous baseball player, his kids don't even speak to each other anymore. Nancy Cruzan in Florida, that case was between the husband and her parents, ended up in Congress, whether to turn off the respirator. In the United States Congress, it was on the news for months. This document can be two pages long. It says, I'd like you to turn it off, or I'd like you to leave it on until the insurance runs out. Whatever you want to say. Not difficult. Healthcare power. This allows you to name someone to make medical decisions for you. This is Massachusetts law. This is hard black and white Massachusetts law. If you go to the hospital and you go to be admitted up at the counter, the first thing they'll ask you is do you have insurance? The second thing they'll ask you is do you have a health care proxy? And you say yes or no. If you say no, they'll get sad and hand you a form as if that's the time to do your form filling out when you're going into the hospital. It's not the best time. You can entrust a chosen person with health care decisions, the termination of life support, funeral and burial arrangements, donating organs, oh my goodness. None of this we want to think about. So, just take a moment and say, I trust you, do a simple form, and then stop thinking about it. You don't have to spend your life thinking about it. Just one form. Doesn't even have to be from a lawyer. Go online and type in healthcare proxy, Massachusetts, and pay $30 and print it on your printer. So you see, prior to our death, there are documents that can help us get through the ups and downs of life. 
And then death does come. Death does come. And if you are a Christian and a believer in Jesus Christ, death is no big deal. It's just moving day. It's just moving day. You're just moving from one uh, shelter to the next. And the next one is better. So it's nothing to be afraid of. However, when you leave, if things aren't in order here, your last testimony might not be a positive statement. So what happens after your death? Well, you know you can't take it with you no matter what it is. You can't take it with you. We don't even really take our name up there. He's going to give us in Revelations a white rock with a new name. We don't even take our bodies with us. There's really not much we take except our spirits. So what are the distribution techniques for the things that we leave here? Again, there are four, three of which I will have some accountability for, and the fourth I want no responsibility for. Remember, procrastination was that fourth obstacle that I can't be responsible for. There's a fourth distribution technique that I don't want responsibility for. I'll tell it to you. But here are the three. One is do nothing. Just do nothing. It's a nice day. Play golf. Plan your next vacation. Barbecue on the weekend. Be involved in your church when you die. Don't worry about it. You'll be gone. Somebody will clean up the mess. Number two, have a will. Have a will. Have a piece of paper, maybe done by a lawyer, that says, I wish the following. It's good to write something down. Now, the will won't apply to many of your assets. It won't apply to anything that's jointly owned or that has a beneficiary designation. But it will apply to something left only in your name. However, it does have to go through the courts. And many people say, well, I thought if you have a will, it avoids the court. And I respect that opinion. But the opinion is inaccurate. It's precisely the opposite. No one can use a will until they're in the court system and it's been approved by the probate judge. The filing fee to go up and open a file is $495, more than the cost of the will. That's just to open the file. So it's not always the most cost efficient, I've got my, my ducks in a row uh, document but it is helpful. A trust, we'll discuss, a trust uh, seems big and scary, but it's really just having a purse. Having a purse. Some of you that are female are used to having a purse. Some of you that are male are not, but the males might be used to having a toolbox. You see, it's just storage, personal storage that you're in control of. That's all it is. So if you have a purse, it's not you. It's not human. But you rely on it to store personal things. If you have a, a toolbox, it's not you, it's not human, but you rely on it to store the tools. And the function of storage has some value in your life, or you, wouldn't, or you just leave things lying on the floor. A trust is a storage entity to hold your assets. That's all it is. Well, why bother? Because if it holds your assets, then upon your death, Nothing goes through the court. And it's just that simple. Also, nothing's publicized. Also, the instructions of your wishes can be in the storage vehicle and automatically administered immediately. So those are some of the reasons why. Here's do nothing. It's popular. It has a Latin name, a legal name called intestate. And uh, you, as Christians, will understand this more than anyone else. In is Latin for none. Testate is from the Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, where God makes his promises. So this basically means no promises. I've made no promises. Now, I'm enjoying life. It's a comfortable couch, and the Red Sox are doing pretty well. But I've made no promises, no estate plan. So when this man dies... You go through the assets, you decide what is there, who owns what, what names are on them, and then who gets it? How do you know? How do you know? You don't know what the distribution will be. The fees and taxes are not avoided. Probate court is not avoided. So you've got some work here. The reason I put this on the slide is if you choose do nothing, I respect that choice 
And all I ask you to do is take my business card and stick it in your underwear drawer. That's all I ask. Because your underwear drawer is the first place people will look for cash. And if they find my business card and you've left a mess, I would welcome the work. <laughs> I can clean up messes after people die. I know how to park my car, where to go into the courtroom, uh, get your kids to pay the filing fee, fill out the forms. It's a little sad, but you chose to do nothing. Distribution technique number two, have a will. Well, what is a will? A will is a written letter to the judge. Very simple, a written letter to the judge. And it, you know, reads something like this. Your Honor, I am afraid that I am deceased. That's why you're reading this letter. Probably some lawyer paid the filing fee and is standing 25 feet away from you. How are you doing? I want to share my wishes about my assets. I'm not sure if these wishes will cover all my assets. The seminar at church said maybe not. But this will was cheap. I got it online, so here's what I want. Amount to the church. Amount to the library. Pay my bills. Pay the lawyer. The rest to my kids. Oh, 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 one grandchild gets this special amount. Thank you for reading and listening to my will, Your Honor. Have a nice day. Please tell my family not to fight. There you go. Next slide. A will is a set of written instructions for the probate judge to follow in disposing of property you own at your death. What you thought? I thought the kids could take the will over to Unibank and get the money. Oh, no. A set of written instructions for the judge, not for the kids. You don't walk into any place with a will, except the courtroom. Will has no power outside of the courtroom, ever, in the history of ever. It's a document for the judge. The judge will appoint who he's going to appoint. It used to be called executor. You know that term. Now, of course, we have to keep changing everything, right? So now it's no longer called executor. It's called personal representative. So your personal representative is named in the will? No. Nominated in the will, but appointed by the judge. If you say, well, my will says my son can be my executor. No. The judge says your son can be the executor. Your will suggests that you want your son to be the executor. Your son doesn't walk into the bank and say, here's the will, I'm in charge. Your son goes up to the court and says, here's the will, will you please put me in charge? And then court papers signed by the judge are what go to the bank. Pardon? Oh, absolutely. The judge has a statutory obligation to find if this person nominated by the deceased is suitable and willing and able. So the judge will ask questions. You've named your son. Where does your son live? At the North Pole, Your Honor. Oh, at the North Pole? Wow. Can he read English? Yes. Is he trustworthy? Well, he's on drugs. Oh, is there anybody else named in the will? The judge has some responsibility to society, you know. That's why we pay their salaries. So you've nominated someone, but the circumstances will be taken into consideration. Now, if the person you nominated is standing right there next to the lawyer with a haircut and says, I'm ready, I love my mother, I will do this, you can trust me, I'll account to you on court forms, Your Honor, then the judge says, you got the job, next case. Of course, that's what we want, right? I would say that it is always permissible to have co-executors. But whether it's advisable is your judgment call. Yes, yes. Remember that human beings 
are human. So we have self-centered perspectives, all of us. That's why Jesus came to earth. So when you put two people in charge together with self-centered perspectives, you have a weakness there. It's called humanity. And that weakness can surface. So it's permissible, of course. But whether it's advisable depends on who you're choosing. And it depends on their personal character and integrity. I don't recommend it. But I don't tell clients what to do. I love estate planning because it really works and it really helps families. And I've been doing it for 30 years. But I've seen co-personal representatives go well, and I've seen co-personal representatives go not well. You can have a first choice, second choice. So if the first choice says, oh, I don't want to be bothered with this, then the second choice can do it. Or the first choice says, I've got young kids, I can't do this, then the second choice can do it. But yes, co is permissible. Notice the end of the definition about wills. Disposing of property you owned at your death. I just want to emphasize that. If you have a checking account with your daughter's name on it, when you die, you do not own it. Your daughter owns it. Two owners minus one equals one. So the will does not dispose of that checking account. Well, it was my checking account. Yes, it was, until you died. And now it's your daughter's checking account. And the will does not control it. Oh, but there's kind of a lot of money in there. Well, that's very nice. Well, I wanted it to go to all the children equally. Well, that's very nice. Well, I said so in my will. Well, that's very nice. Who owns the money? Your daughter. Oh, well, I'm sure that she'll divide it with her brothers and sisters. Okay. That's your call. Ask your daughter's husband how he feels about dividing that money that his wife now owns with your, your, your other kids. There's the rub, the in-laws. So if we need to, we'll go through the probate court upon your death for the legal process of transferring property to your heirs. The legal process of transferring property to your heirs. And it works. We do pay the bills first, and we do pay the taxes and the filing fees and the lawyer and blah, 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 blah. And then we determine your heirs. And if there's a will, we read it. And if there's not, we just pull the law books off the shelf. You know, the guys and girls in Boston came up with something of who they think should get your money if you didn't have anything to say. They did their best. And they look for spouses and kids, of course. And here's what happens in probate. I just want you to know this is going to be a 15-second lesson. This is what happens. We give notice to your creditors if we know them. If we know of your creditors, we give them notice. And they have one year to come after the money. So we don't close out the estate for a year. We wait a year for the creditors. We put an ad in the paper. You've seen it. Just go look at the Blackstone Valley Tribune. You'll see the ads in the paper. We itemize the inventory of what you own. We sell assets if need be. We pay court fees and attorney fees. We pay your bills, any claims that come in, your taxes. If there's a dispute, we're in the court. We can litigate and resolve the dispute. What a convenience that is to already be in the court. We have a docket number. We have a folder. We have a judge. Just get enough attorneys and have a hearing. If there's a challenge to the validity of the will, then we, d we address the challenge to the validity of the will. If someone says, oh, I don't think that will is accurate, or I don't think mother knew what she was signing, come on into the court. We'll talk about it. And then we file an account for the judge to approve everything we've done. We need the judge to approve everything we've done. What if someone stole some money? We have to find out. So this is what happens in probate court. This happens over and over, every day, month after month, nine to five, for hundreds of years. It's called probate. It takes time. I just told you we can't close the file for a year because of a state statute. It costs money. I told you at least the filing fee, not the newspaper costs and not the attorney's fees. And it's not very private. So your will is public and your assets are public and this whole affair is public. The newspaper ad is public. 
Just look at the next copy of the newspaper in the legal department. You'll see who died, who's supposed to be appointed, and the, the number for the case. You can head up to the courthouse and read everything. And sometimes we have relatives that disagree. Obviously, we don't want relatives to disagree. But sometimes they do. So then we have this technique called a trust. Uh, before we look at this, and then we'll pretty much be done, um, let me tell you the fourth technique, the one that I don't want to be responsible for, and it's called joint ownership. Joint ownership or joint tenancy. It's where you put someone's name on your asset. Maybe your checking account, your savings account, maybe your house, maybe lots of names, maybe all the kids' names are on the house. And someone told you, well, that's the way to go. And someone told you, keep back a life estate, whatever a life estate is. And so you thought, yeah, I love my kids. I'll, I'll put them on my assets. OK, now, if you die, when you die, the people whose names are on your assets will own the asset. And if that's what you're looking for, then please consider joint tenancy. However, if there was a capital increase in value, they're stuck with that capital gains tax. And before your death, their ownership opens the door to risk. If they get a divorce, if they have bankruptcy, if they have credit card problems, if they get in an accident, if someone sues them, their name is on your stuff. So their trouble becomes your trouble. Oh, well, I didn't mean for that to be. When you put someone's name on your asset, you put someone's name on your asset. They own it. It's in their life. They own it today. Also, I've seen cases where the jointly hold asset was there and everything was fine. Then something happened in the relationship, and the child went and closed out the bank account. Closed out the bank account? Yes. Yeah, after 30 years, you see a lot. So let's look at trust for a minute. What is a trust? A trust is a box. No need to get complicated. No need for legal mumbo jumbo. A will is a letter. A trust is a box. What do you put in a box? I don't know. What do you own? Well, I have a house. OK, put the house in there. I have a couple of bank accounts. A few different banks, OK? Put them in. How would I do that? Oh, easier than you think. Well, what about my life insurance? Yeah, your life insurance can flow into the box after your death. Just let the insurance company know that's where you want the money to go. Well, I've got my kids named as beneficiaries. That's fine. That's fine. There are options here. There are options here. Well, one of my kids is having some problems. Oh, I see. A human being, one of your kids is. One of your kids is a human being. All human beings have problems. That's why Jesus said, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might. You will have trouble. But fear not, I have overcome the world. Jesus said, you're going to live on earth? Problems. He even says, if you're married, you're going to have trouble. Marriage equals trouble. OK? No marriage is trouble free. Thus says the Lord. So life is full of trouble. So why don't we accept it? And as Christians, be the best managers of trouble under God that we can possibly be. I want to manage my trouble-laden marriage for the Lord. I want to manage my trouble-laden life, my illnesses, my financial stresses for the Lord. Let him be glorified. That's what you read in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Problems, problems, problems. But God in them all. So how does a trust work? Well, you see, we have people on the left, assets in the middle, and the box on the right. And so the people put the assets in the box. My wife wakes up in the morning. She puts the tissue and the lipstick in the purse. Not very complicated. Out the door she goes. Lipstick and the tissue in the purse. So checking accounts, houses, whatever your assets might be, in the box it goes. Now, why would we bother? Well, 
it can help to control the distribution because we're not relying on some lawmaker that wrote something in a law book and we're not relying on a will that has to go to court. Trust doesn't have to go to court. Why would it have to go to court? It never dies. The person that set it up dies, but the trust doesn't. So we're never stuck with assets left in the name of a deceased. We never need the court system. So we don't need the lawyers, and we don't need the judges, and we don't need the legislators. The distribution is helped because you wrote what you wanted. We minimize fees and taxes, and we completely avoid probate court. There's the benefits of it. Who's involved? Well, there are three parties involved. To the left, well, in the middle is the trust store. The trust store creates the box. This would be the person that drives over to Walmart and buys the purse, pays for it and walks out. Oh, you just created a storage uh, entity for yourself. You bought a purse. You went to Home Depot. You bought a toolbox, a fishing tackle box. You created this entity. So you sign a paper called the trust. You created it. The trustee is the person that's in charge. Now, of course, you probably prefer that you be in charge of your own things. So if you create a trust, put yourself in charge. Be the trustor and the trustee. And then the beneficiary is the person that is entitled to reach in and get out the stuff. My wife bought her own purse. I had nothing to do with it. I don't know the first thing about purses. She put stuff in there. I couldn't even begin to tell you what's in there. And when she says, go on my purse and find such and such and so and so, I can't do it. I can't find anything in there. But she can. And she has the beneficiary role of the benefit of what's ever in there. I don't have any beneficiary role and don't need it, but she does. So she created it, she's in charge of it, and she has the benefit of it. That's what a simple trust is. You create it, put your own things in it, put yourself in charge, and you're the beneficiary of it. You know, when the grandchild comes to our house, there's a cookie jar on the counter. Now, my wife bought the cookie jar and made the cookies and put the cookies in. So she's the trustor of the jar and the trustee of the jar. But there are three beneficiaries. My wife, who's welcome to a cookie, myself, who sometimes gets access, and that little girl called granddaughter who has a beneficial interest and knows it. So there are three beneficiaries, one trustor, one trustee, and three beneficiaries. So that's all you need to know about trust. You can be the trustor, the trustee, and the beneficiary of your own trust. In other words, this big scary thing where you think, oh, lawyers and banks are going to take away control, there's no lawyer involved, no bank involved, and you're in complete control. There's no bank or lawyer written into the document with any rights at all. The lawyer just typed it up. You're the one with the rights. You can maintain asset control over assets in your trust, just like a woman's purse. So it's not that scary and complex. Oh, it is a concept, a little different than just having it in your pocket. Here's a case study, very simple, Mrs. Goodman. Mrs. Goodman had no children. Okay, well, that's none of my business. Her estate value, does it really matter? No. What if it said $250,000? Okay. What if it said $10 million? Okay. God doesn't care what your state value is. God cares what your heart is. God's not impressed with your numbers. He says so many times. He's looking at the heart. So estate planning, oh yes, the numbers go up. The planning has more value. So what? Mrs. Goodman takes her money, whatever it is, puts it in a box and calls it Mrs. Goodman's Trust. Very creative. Upon the death of Mrs. Goodman, where does it go? She didn't have any children. I don't know. You tell me. She chose for it to go to some friend's children. And this is a true story. I can't tell you her first name or her address, but she was a church member. I'm a church member. My life is about church members. And the church member was a young mother whose husband was killed as a soldier, a military family with young kids. And there was not enough money there for those kids' schooling. 
Mrs. Goodman served up at the altar doing the flowers with this young mother and knew the situation. And in her trust, left her money for the kids' college. Now, she didn't tell the friend, but she told the pastor. And upon her death, the pastor told the friend, talk about a blessing. She maintained complete control of her assets. When she did get sick, there was no need for guardianship because not only did she have a trust, she had a power of attorney, she had a living will, she had a health care proxy. And who do you think was named in all of the documents? The friend, the single mother, who she loved with all her heart. She named the same person in all those documents? Hey, you pick. You pick. Well, what about her nephew? Oh, her nephew. Why not name the nephew? She didn't trust the nephew. In fact, after her death, the nephew called my office and said, where's my inheritance? And I said, excuse me? And he says, look, my aunt had no kids. I'm the nephew. I'm in the bloodline. Where's my money? And I said, well, what are you expecting? I'm expecting everything in her estate. And I says, okay, you're in the bloodline. No, you're right. Massachusetts law would leave everything in her estate to you. Now, let's see, what is left in her estate? What is an estate? Oh, the property that we own at death. Well, young man, I'm sorry, but your aunt did not own any property at her death. Oh, yes, she did. I've been by that little two-bedroom ranch. She kept it up meticulously. The gutters are scrubbed clean. That house is worth a lot of money. Her car was always clean. She has bank accounts. When her husband died 20 years ago, he left her insurance. You better believe there's money. I said, oh, there's money, but no estate. Because everything you're aware of was in her trust. That's not an estate. And I don't see your name in the trust. Oh, what are you talking about? I'm getting a lawyer. I'm getting a lawyer. Please get the best you can. The lawyer calls me. Well, ho, 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 ho. And I say, well, if you'd like, I'll show you the bank statements. I'll show you the deed to the house. Mrs. Goodman Trust is on all the paperwork. So Mrs. Goodman didn't own anything at her death. So there's no estate for anybody to inherit. The name of the trust is on all the paperwork. The trust owns everything. It's the trust that determines where it's going. And it's going to the college that these kids attend. And the attorney sent a letter of apology, which I'll never throw away. The attorney sent a letter of apology for his client being so rough with me. Estate planning challenge number 10,000, taxes. Oh my goodness. Let's not have a big talk about taxes on a beautiful day like this. Let's just know that at death, the government wants one more piece. And so if you have enough, you give them a piece. If you don't have enough, they let you pass. If you have enough, over a million dollars, and you think, oh, they're going to take a tax when I die, we can talk about it. We can plan around it. You know what the simplest way to avoid that tax? Is to leave money to the church in your plan. That's the simplest way. First of all, the check is written right out to the church. You fill out the tax return. You take a strict dollar-for-dollar dollar deduction for that gift. This is a post-death gift, by the way and pfft, no tax due. So you get two benefits. You're funding the kingdom, which is going to last, and you're denying the government. I'm not saying cheat on your taxes. I'm saying only pay what you have to and don't pay what you don't have to. It's called charitable giving. Taxes are due nine months after the date of death, so there's not a lot of time uh, for the family to deal with this. It's better that you think about it ahead of time. Otherwise, the estate will shrink, and everyone says, oh, death and taxes, death and taxes. Hey, we're dealing with both of those right here. Death and taxes aren't scary, and they're inevitable. Why not deal with them? An unlimited marital deduction is a gift that you have from Congress if you're married. So upon the first death, the surviving spouse could say, I don't want to pay any taxes right now. I'm a surviving spouse. And Congress says, okay, okay, you can have an unlimited deduction because there was a marriage. 
But when you die, <laughs> we'll wait. The IRS usually outlasts both spouses. So this is great for the first death. Now, I have more case studies here, but I don't want to burden you. So let me just point out that if there's a married couple with four children, and one of the ch children is married, and one's in college, and two are still at home, you have different issues, right? You have the issues that there's a marriage. You have the issues that there's children at home, minors. Maybe they need a guardian in case the parents die. You have how, how are we going to pay for college if the parents die? And what about the child that's already married and out there in the world? Shouldn't they get their inheritance quickly? These issues are talked through with you. One issue at a time, they're talked through with you. And your document addresses them all. Yes, if my wife and I die with young children, I'd like so-and-so to be nominated as their guardian. Well, good that you had the choice. Imagine if you don't have anything to say about that issue. Who's going to raise your kids? Oh, yes, the one that's married should probably get their inheritance. On the other hand, the one in college should get college paid for because I paid for college for the one that's married. So maybe we hold off on the inheritance for the one that's married until we finish paying for college for the middle one. That's what living people do. So why not have dead people do it? Well, how would that work? Ah, who did you leave in charge of the box? I left someone in charge of the box that I trust. Good job. Good job. The child going to college will call that person that you trust and say, I've got a tuition bill. Can I send it to you? Sure. I'll make out a check right to the school. Ah, oh, thank you. This is so hard going to college after my parents died in that accident. But at least I'm not in court, not dealing with lawyers, and my share is going to pay for my school, as it would if they were living. What about my younger brothers and sisters? They have shares too. Their needs are being met. Well, who's their guardian? Aunt Matilda. Oh, what a good choice. Aunt Matilda. Okay, we're moving along. Maintain control. Avoid guardianship. Avoid probate. Eliminate taxes. One more type of trust, just so that you know, is called special needs trust. If there is a situation with special needs, let's say that it's a child, child or an adult that has some special need relating to mental capacity. It could be a physical disability as well, or both. Let's say they're on government benefits, SSDI, SSI, Section 8 housing, or someday they will be, and you know it. And you quietly think to yourself, hmm, this has been a rough road having this child, and if I died, what in the world would happen then? I've held it all together for this child their whole life. Well, the special needs trust can hold the assets and meet the special needs without kicking them off the government benefits. The trust would act on your behalf after your death. A very sensitive and meticulously drafted document to honor the rules of the government benefits that your child is getting. But it can be done. The two issues are managing the money after you're gone and maintaining the benefit eligibility. So special needs trusts, I've done many of them, have to be carefully drafted and carefully administered. And if they're not carefully drafted or carefully administered, then Social Security will simply say, hey, look at all that money. We're going to stop the checks to this person. Social Security doesn't care about anybody. So they're just going to say, hey, that person has money, take them off the rolls. Then you have to appeal, oh, what a headache. So if you have this situation, draft carefully, administer carefully, and let the balance between the trust funds and Social Security be carefully maintained. It can happen. So uh, if you want to give money when you're alive, no lawyer needed, write a check, reduce your estate, Reduce your tax exposure. Make people happy. It's more blessed to give than receive. It's a great estate planning tool. I have people come to me all the time afraid of the nursing home. Oh, the nursing home, the nursing home, they're going to take everything I own. Well, lifetime giving is one aspect of preparing for that possible scenario when you're in the nursing home. Are there rules? Yes. Are there complexities? Yes. Is the nursing home going to take all your assets? No. It's a myth. 
The nursing homes have never taken one penny from anybody. But it's a myth that I can't seem to squelch, so I'll entertain it. Nursing homes do not take people's money. The real issue is that if you are needing nursing home care and not wanting to pay for it yourself, you ask the taxpayer to pay for it by getting on Medicaid. And the issue is, how do I get on Medicaid? How am I eligible for Medicaid? That's the issue, not protecting things from the nursing home. Will Medicaid take your money? No. They'll just say, we're not putting you on the program. It's that simple. You're on the program or you're not. If you're on, they'll help you with your nursing home bills. If you're not, they won't help you with your nursing home bills. No one chases your money. I know there's an ad on WBZE and it's very convincing. Oh, the nursing home costs $12,000 a month. Call this number or you're dead. You know, every, the nursing home will take everything. That ad is inaccurate. So, if you want to give your money, give your money. I mean, many Christians give money to the church every week. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That makes God happy. Go ahead. Lifetime giving is a good thing. Charitable gifts, it doesn't have to just be the church. It can be the library. It can be the Red Cross. It can be the Salvation Army. It can be missions organizations. You see, all of us in this room share a common goal. And the common goal is this. We want to acquire what we can within reason. We don't want to worship wealth. That's sin. That puts wealth above God. But we want to acquire what we can. You know the parable of the talents. He gives you a talent. He wants to see some return on that. Acquiring what you can is biblical, as long as you don't worship it. Then you want to be stewards of it. You want to be stewards of it. And the last act of stewardship, other than everything you've learned in these classes you've been attending, is when you die. That's your last the last time you get to be a steward, and that's done through estate planning. We don't want to give it to the government. We've left enough to the government. That's fine. Jesus says, give Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. Give Caesar what is Caesar's, not a penny more. So you give Caesar what is Caesar's. Don't just leave it all to Caesar. That's not what he said, right? So I want to thank you for listening to a lawyer on a beautiful sunny day. I'm done. I will offer you a few tools if you're interested, if you're interested. And you can take them home and never see me again. Okay? One is a piece of paper that lists the documents that we mentioned. And a few others we didn't. So you can just go home and say, oh yes, this is what uh, was mentioned at the seminar. I'm glad to have it written down. I didn't take notes. The other is a very short one-page brochure that just summarizes what you learned. Not legal talk, just English, not a big book, no laws quoted. So a list of the documents and a little brochure, you're welcome to them. If you're so inclined, if you say, I want to really start thinking about this and making a plan, that's fine. You can take this home and write out who would be my personal representative in my will, who would be my trustee in my, if I got a trust, who would be in my health care proxy making medical decisions, who would I hand the pen to in a power of attorney, would I use co-people, would I use this person then this person as the backup, what would I want to have happen to my assets, what if I left it to my kids but they died in the same car crash that I died in, oh my gosh I never thought of that one. Just read through the thing and fill it out and take it to... How much fee for a trust? Well, the cost of a trust will vary depending upon what you ask for the trust to say. So if you say, I have three kids, one third each, end of discussion, that's an easier job for an attorney than if you say, I have 14 cousins and five charities and we're going to space this out over 30 years and give them monthly allowances, and then on their 30th birthday, they get a new car, and you know. So it depends on what you draft. And also it depends on the attorney. So the prices will be different in Whitensville than they are Worcester or, or Boston. I can give you the range for what a trust would cost in my law practice, and that range is a trust would cost anywhere between $900 up to $1,500. Now the other documents could be 
well, I gave you one quote, $125 for a really good comprehensive power of attorney. Healthcare proxies can be $100 each. Living wills can be $100 each. So if you got a really good trust with some real meat to it, and you paid $1,500, and then you paid a few hundred for these other things, you could be moving up towards $2,000 for your one-time lifetime investment. And for that, get everything you need right here, all pre-organized for you, everything. The trust, the power of attorney, a will if you want one, healthcare proxy, living will, list of your bank accounts, everything the kids would need. All the kids have to do is just find this book. Oh, well, how would I get the house in? We just do a new deed for your house. Transfer it from John Rexford to John Rexford's trust. Run it up to Worcester, pay the fee, put it on the record. Done. Could I still sell it? Well, of course. You're the trustee of the trust. Of course you could still sell it. Well, how much does that cost? Well, it cost a couple hundred dollars to do the new deed and a couple hundred dollars to record the new deed. Oh, that adds up to three or four hundred dollars. Yes, it does. Less than the filing fee for a will. So you have to step back and get the big picture here. Oh, I'd have to spend money to do estate planning. You have to spend money to go to Walmart. Yeah. Yes, you spend money. Everything you do, you spend money. The question is, what do you get for it? That's the question. So you're welcome to one of these. You're welcome to this little worksheet. And you can fill it out and go to any lawyer you want. If you say, oh, I'd like to meet with John someday, that's fine. Here's my card, here's my calendar. The last few days of May, there's appointments. Feel free to meet, and write your name, and call me, and, and meet. I would, in the office setting, I would charge a fee because it's so personal, so private, so intense, and completely confidential. So I'm not taking phone calls. I'm not trying to sell you on myself. I'm listening to you and addressing your issues and discussing all these options. So I just charge you for an hour of my time which is $160. So, you know, that's my hourly rate after 30 years. Yes? Several years ago, I sold my home my son. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I'm not saying it's not such a great idea, depending upon your goals, uh, depending upon your goals. I will say this that you don't have a house. Okay, you don't have a house, so just be aware of that. And so it's your son's house. It's your son's house. And um, you have a right to live there. It's a legal right to live there, which has some monetary value, by the way. If you were to go apply for Medicaid, the value of your right to live there would be included on your application. It's possible that you will have a wonderful life and your son will pay the bills for the house. I hope your son's paying the bills. He owns the house. Oh, what a great deal for your son. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you're a wonderful mom. <laughs> His house and you're paying the bills. I wish my mom would do that. <laughs> um, the big question is, you know, could your son ever ask you to leave? And the answer is, of course. Oh, but I have a legal right to live there. Yes, you do. You have a legal right to live there. But what is the law? It's a concept. The law is a concept. The law doesn't redeem our souls. The blood of Jesus redeems our souls. The most that the law can do is point to our sin. That's all it can do. It can't improve our life. The law is just a concept. So the concept, I have the right to live there, is nice. You have that concept. But if you come home and the locks are changed, you're not going to sleep there that night. And when your son or daughter-in-law, I said it's the in-laws, says, well, mom, you know, you've been a little problematic lately and you didn't do what we asked you to do. And everybody starts crying. Now, I could enforce the life estate, but that costs money. If you own the house, the son can't change the locks. The locksmith won't do it. If the son owns the house, the locksmith will change the locks. This is a terrible thing you're saying, John. I know. I know. I'm just answering the question. Any other questions? Yes. 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 Very good question. 
Many people say, oh, I'm moving to Florida. Will my will be good down there? Yes. If it was valid in Massachusetts, under Massachusetts law, it will be honored in Florida. It will be honored in the other states. It's in the Constitution. It's called the Full Faith and Credit Clause. The trusts are even better. The trusts aren't subject to any state statute. The trust is based on contract and property law. So it's not even subject to a particular state statute. So the trust is even more portable than the will. The will is subject to a state statute, but can move because of the Full Faith and Credit Clause. The trust just moves, like the purse. Purses can be bought at Walmart in Whitensville and taken to any state. Yeah. Now, you do have to take the trust with you, you know. I really think that, for example, like, mother lives in Texas. Yes. She, right now, we have, my father died a year ago, did not probate the will. Yes. 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 Yes, if your mother has assets that she has control over, she can put them in a box. She's a living human being, she can put them in a box, just like Mrs. Goodman, who was a widow. Yeah, now she would do a Texas trust, but then if she moved to Massachusetts to live with her daughter, bring it with her. I do Massachusetts trust based on Massachusetts law and tell my clients, take it anywhere you want. But if you live in a different state, you know, I don't do that work. I'm licensed in Massachusetts, yeah. But good question. Great questions. Anybody want to try and answer, ask an even better one? <laughs> the downside of a trust is uh, not like falling off a cliff. First of all, it's 900 to $1,500 which you could have used on a new lawnmower. And second of all, it's this, yeah, or, yeah, or a vacation, you know, yeah, round trip to Disney World for a couple of days, so it does cost money. Although you don't have to pay every year, and you don't have to pay when you die. You pay once. The other downside, however, is that it's a document about a half inch thick, which is thicker than a will, because there's legal language in there making it crystal clear that although you don't own these assets, that you're in charge of them and have the right to act like an owner. And that is specifically spelled out over and over. You can do this, you can do that, you can do this, you can do that, as if you were the owner. You happen to wear a hat called trustee, but we want you to live like an owner. So it's a half inch thick document. And then thirdly, if you buy a purse, you have to go home and put your stuff into it. You know, one time, Years ago, I bought my wife a little jewelry box for Christmas. We had young kids. With young kids, it's about kids, right? So the jewelry box sat on the bureau, and the jewelry never got into the box. We had other things on our mind with three young kids. And one day, as husbands will do, who bought a jewelry box, I said, honey, don't you like your jewelry box? Well, sure, I think it's wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, how come you don't ever put any jewelry in it? Oh, oh, that's right, that's right. I gotta put the jewelry in the box, you know? The jewelry box had been paid for, I had the receipt. It looked great on the bureau, but it, we weren't getting the value for it because it wasn't holding the jewelry. If you're gonna get a trust and pay for it, get the value for it. Put your assets in the trust. Otherwise, you've got an empty box sitting on your bureau. That's a waste of money. So when people come to me and say they want to hire me, they want to pay me money, they want me to be their lawyer, they want me to type up a blue book, you know, I say, okay, I'll do it, but can we have a talk about putting your things in the box? Because I don't want to get a bad reputation as the guy that passes out blue notebooks that don't help anybody. So I will talk with you about what do you own? How can we get it in the box? And if you want to pay for my help getting it in the box, pay for my help getting in the box. Otherwise, I'll give you written instructions and send you off to the bank. Life insurance policies pass by beneficiary designation. That's the nature of the beast. Same as annuities, same as IRAs, same as 401ks. Beneficiary designation is huge. So you choose who the beneficiary of your life insurance will be. Can you name your new trust as the beneficiary? Of course. Just get a beneficiary form to write the name of the trust, send it back to the agent. When you die, they'll make out a check to your trust. 
Well, what happens to the money after that? I don't know. I have to read the trust. But it's going through the trust because the trust was the beneficiary. The insurance company could care less. Well, what if my trust leaves something to the church? Well, then the church will get some of your life insurance money. I only type the thing. Does it start to make sense? Yeah, everything you own can be tied to the box somehow. Oh, yes. Age has nothing to do with it. Gender has nothing to do with it. It's just a box. What qualifications do you have to have to get a box? Not many. Intent. Intent is the only one. Yeah. So I've done, you know, boxes for elderly people, for newlyweds, for people that never had kids. The most difficult cases are the people that never had kids because they have all these objects of their affection apart from children. Social causes, save the whales, you name it. And they want to leave money all over the globe to, to save society. And I think it's absolutely wonderful. But it's a lot of typing. It's a lot easier just to type in the names of a few kids. And the other difficult client is engineers. Because engineers have a mind that's so meticulous. And they think in such a meticulous way. And I'm so glad they do because I drive over the bridges that they design. <laughs> So I'm glad they have a meticulous mind when they design things. But when it comes to estate planning, they can go into great detail. And I can be typing into amazing detail about how much per month per child and what if the child has a problem and what if the child doesn't get a haircut or won't sell the motorcycle or smells like alcohol. I mean, whew, do we get into detail with engineers? And do I go there with them? Every client, I go where they want to go. That's why I like estate planning. It's about people, not legal documents. It's about people. That's what I like about it. So if you're an engineer, I might type a little more and charge you a little more, but you can get exactly what you want. If you don't have any kids and you say, oh, I do have some money, I think I'll do this with it. Terrific. Let's type it up because if you don't type it up, it'll just go according to Massachusetts law to your nephew. What does Massachusetts law have to say about your social causes in your heart, you know? Folks in Boston don't have a clue what's in your heart. God knows. Legislators don't. I don't. So you see, there's actually a little opportunity here. A little opportunity to leave the earth with one last stroke of, to God be the glory. And then you can look back and see people saying, Amen. For less than $2,000, we avoided the entire Massachusetts court system. And things went exactly as that person wanted. With 100 grand or 100 million, doesn't matter. Typing is the same.